The 14th of April 1988, the Persian Gulf. Iran and Iraq have been locked in a deadly war for years, and in an attempt to harm each other's economies, both sides have begun to launch attacks on shipping moving through the Persian Gulf, especially oil tankers. Using speedboats equipped with heavy machine guns and rocket launchers, Exocet anti-ship missiles and Silkworm shore-based missile batteries, both sides have been taking a serious toll on both friendly and neutral shipping moving through the area. Many nations have called on the Soviet Union and the United States to protect their ships, prompting the Soviets to sponsor several vessels personally and the US to move its navy into the area. But there's a fourth weapon that Iran has deployed, anti-ship mines, and these are indiscriminate killers. Without any warning, the guided missile frigate USS Samuel B. Roberts strikes an Iranian mine, blowing a huge hole in the hull. Incredibly, nobody is killed, but multiple crew members are seriously burned and the ship is taking on water at a tremendous rate. The expertly trained crew, however, rapidly conducts damage control measures and the ship manages to limp back to a friendly port where it will later be shipped back to the US via a recovery vessel. Navy divers, meanwhile, recover multiple mines from the area and trace the serial numbers to a ship seized by the US a year earlier, which had been converted by Iran to lay mines. The infamous tanker war being waged between Iran and Iraq has now caught the full attention of the United States of America, and three separate surface action groups are quickly organized. The US Navy will undertake what President Ronald Reagan considers a proportionate response meant to deter the Iranians from further aggression in the region. The end result will be a 24-hour war between the US and Iran. Four days later, on April 18th, the Navy prepares to strike. Backed up by aircraft flying from the aircraft carrier Enterprise, the SAGs have two objectives. First, sink the Iranian SOM-class frigate Sabalan, or a suitable substitute of equal military value. This will severely hamper Iran's ability to threaten shipping in the Gulf, and impose a significant cost to the Iranian regime for their ongoing attacks against shipping. Objective number two is the destruction of Iranian surveillance posts on the Sasan, Siri, and Rakish oil platforms. These platforms have long stopped producing oil, but are now being used by Iranian forces to coordinate attacks in the Gulf. Their destruction will make it much more difficult for Iran to vector in shore-based fire or guide its fleet of small attack craft to waiting targets. Lastly, the Navy is to do everything in its power to avoid or limit civilian casualties and to limit any potential environmental effects that the attacks on any old oil platforms may cause. Surface Action Group Bravo is assigned the Sasan and Rakish oil platforms with SAG Charlie the Suri platform. SAG Delta will take on the Sabalan and ensure it's destroyed. The USS Gary, a Perry-class frigate, will remain on call to provide direct support to any of the three SAGs, while providing security for transiting civilian traffic in case of Iranian retaliation. At 0800 hours, SAG Bravo approaches the Sasan platform. US Marines load up onto transport helicopters and take to the air, as the Iranian platform is given a radio warning that it's about to be attacked. The Americans order the Iranians to evacuate the platform and are given 20 minutes to do so. However, the Iranian defenders appear to be in no mood for surrender and move to man several 23mm Zu-23 guns. As the deadline comes and passes, the US ships begin to open fire with their main guns. Explosive shells smash into the superstructure of the platform, tearing and twisting metal and sending deadly splinters flying across each platform. The Iranian defenders fire back with their AA guns in sheer desperation. But the twin cannon Zu-23s have no hope of doing much more than scratching the paint on the American ships. The US ships, meanwhile, score several direct hits on gun positions, destroying them and their operators. Finally, some of the Iranians radio a request for a ceasefire so they can evacuate. The US ships comply and allow a number of Iranians to board tugs which they use to flee the platform. Hardliners, however, refuse to surrender, and as soon as their compatriots are safely out of range, begin to open fire on the US ships once more. The American destroyers, USS Merrill and Lind McCormick, return accurate fire that destroys the surviving guns and silences them permanently. This allows Cobra attack helicopters launched from the USS Trenton to strafe the platform with cannon and rocket fire, killing any remaining resistance. US Marines finally board the platform via their transport birds and sweep the mangled wreckage for survivors and intelligence. They manage to secure a single wounded survivor which is immediately medevaced as the Marines plant explosive charges to bring the platform down. Nearby, the attack on the Siri platform plays out much the same, with Iranian defenders briefly exchanging ineffective fire with the US ships before fleeing the platform. The fierce bombardment by the US ships, however, has set the platform on fire, and US Navy SEALs en route to land on the platform and plant demolition charges as well as sweep for survivors and intelligence are forced to turn around. 
the fire is too intense and the platform is deemed to have been rendered unusable by Iran anymore. Two hours later, an Iranian patrol boat, the Jashan, attempts to take revenge on the Americans and rapidly approaches Sag Charlie. The small boat is no match for the US frigates and destroyers, but it's not planning on going toe-to-toe -to -toe with them. Instead, it's delivering a special gift, planning to attack the US ships with American-made Harpoon anti-ship missiles, delivered to Iran before the revolution. Sag Charlie detects the incoming threat and radios a warning to the Jashan, which goes ignored. Suddenly, air defense radars light up on the American ships, confirming the launch of a Harpoon missile from the Jashan. The world's first ship-to-ship -ship missile duel has just started. The US ships immediately engage in defensive maneuvers, adopting a zigzag course that makes it harder for the missile to track its target. However, the missile has been fired from 13 miles away, giving the US ships little time to defend themselves. Normally, any hostile ship would never get within this close a range without being engaged, but the Americans have been expressively ordered not to escalate more than necessary. The Joshan has lived so far only because of an attempt by the US Navy to not escalate hostilities further, but now it's become fair game. The Americans fire off chaff to confuse the Harpoon's guidance system, and the missile splashes harmlessly into the ocean. They then respond with their own missiles, firing a volley of standard surface-to-surface -surface missiles. The lighter missiles, however, only manage to do serious damage to the ship's superstructure, not sink it. The USS Bagley fires its own harpoon, which goes off target. But as the Jashan is dead in the water, the US ships move to within gun range and begin to open fire with their main guns. The Jashan soon is sinking beneath the waves. In retaliation for the destruction of the platforms, though, Iran has dispatched speedboats to attack multiple civilian targets in the Gulf, including the US supply ship Willie Tide, the Panamanian oil rig Scan Bay, and the British tanker York Marine. The USS Enterprise quickly puts up a pair of A6E intruders and an F-14 Tomcat to hunt the speedboats down and deter further attacks. The small, nimble attack boats are fast, but the intruders are faster and manage to catch up to the small flotilla, dropping cluster bombs and strafing them with cannon fire. One of the speedboats is completely destroyed and several others are seriously damaged as they speed away. Iran's Air Force decides to get in on the action, with only one Tomcat in the sky to provide cover for the intruders. The SAGs have no air cover save for their own air defense systems, which are formidable indeed. Two Iranian F-4s are flying in an orbit nearby, which the USS Wayne Wright is ordered to disperse, lest they pose a threat to the US ships or neutral merchant vessels. Lighting them up with their fire control radar, the Wayne Wright is sending a very strong warning, which the F-4s ignore. Finally, the Wayne Wright launches a pair of extended-range standard missiles at the F-4, which gets their attention. The F-4s quickly turn for home and go into full afterburner, but the missiles are faster and one manages to get close enough to detonate and rip off a part of one of the F-4's wings. The stricken plane manages to land safely, but the attack sends a strong message to the Iranian Air Force to stay away. The Iranians now decide to throw their heavier surface combat vessels into the mix, and the Iris Sahand and Iris Sabalan join the fray. First is the Sahand, which departs from its port in Bandar Abbas and steams toward one of the American SAGs. Two American intruders flying combat air patrol over the USS Joseph Strauss spot the frigate and radio a warning to friendly ships. The Sahand immediately engages the A-6s, firing off air defense missiles at the US planes. Dropping chaff and maneuvering to low level, though, the US planes manage to avoid the Iranian missiles, and then immediately turn to exact their revenge. The intruders fire off two harpoons and four laser-guided skipper anti-ship missiles, each armed with a 1,000-pound warhead. The USS Strauss launches its own harpoon attack against the Iranian frigate, which starts to throw off chaff to try to confuse the American missiles. The harpoons have difficulty dealing with the chaff countermeasures, but the skippers are guided to their targets via laser designators and are deadly accurate. No amount of maneuvering or countermeasures can throw them off their course, and the Sahand takes numerous hits. Fire erupts across the ship, burning out of control as the crew begins to abandon ship. Soon, the fire reaches the magazines, which sets off a massive detonation. Anyone not off the ship dies instantly, as the Sahan slinks beneath the waves. The Iris Sabalan has not learned anything from the day's events, it seems, as it soon steams out of port and heads into the fray. It spots American intruders on its air defense radar and engages them with surface-to-air missiles. The Americans once more engage in defensive maneuvers, dropping chaff and flares to throw off the Iranian missiles. Out of surface-to-air missiles, the Sabalan, one of the primary targets of Operation Praying Mantis, is about to discover the power of one of the US military's most revolutionary accomplishments, precision weapons. Lieutenant Commander James Engler turns his A-6 toward the enemy ship. Using a laser designator, he places the laser pip directly on the Sabalan's smokestack. As the intruder roars by overhead, he releases a single Mark 82 laser-guided bomb. 
which uses onboard fins to guide itself as its seeker head sniffs out the intruder's laser designator painted directly onto the enemy ship. In an incredible feat of precision that will be echoed just a few years later in Desert Storm, LCDR Angler puts his bomb directly down the Sabalon smokestack, causing a massive explosion directly in the belly of the ship that rips the engines apart and cripples the vessel. The Sabalon is helpless and listing heavily, its stern below the waterline. However, before the American planes can finish the job, they're ordered to return to base. The US does not want to escalate the fighting further, and deeming the day's events a satisfactory response to Iran's mining of the Gulf, calls off the executioner's blade looming over the Sabalon and its crew. The Iranian frigate will live to see another day, as tugs rush out to save the sinking ship and tow it back home. Later in the day, Iran fires multiple silkworm missiles from shore-based launchers at Seg Delta and the USS Gary. None of the missiles find their targets, and at least one is destroyed by air defense cannon fire, and the rest are lured away by countermeasures. For a moment, a full war between Iran and the US seems imminent, as just a few years previously the US had warned that the use of silkworm missiles against US ships in the region would trigger an automatic retaliation against the Iranian mainland. However, the White House decides that there have been enough casualties for the day and it's not worth escalating the situation further. Thus, the Reagan administration downplays the launching of Iranian silkworms. As night falls, the US takes further de-escalationary measures, which are accepted by Iran. At the end of fighting, Iran has lost six ships at a loss of 56 sailors, with two of the three oil platforms destroyed. The US, meanwhile, loses two, a crew of a Cobra attack helicopter believed to have been killed when their aircraft suffered an unknown malfunction while evading enemy fire. Their bodies are later recovered by US divers, and the wreckage of the Cobra lifted from the seafloor. The 24-hour war between the US and Iran would narrowly avoid a full-blown conflict between the two nations, but tragically set the stage for heightened tensions which would lead directly to the accidental downing of an Iranian airliner by the USS Vincennes. Now, go check out what would happen if the USA and Iran went to war, or click this other video instead.